All right, I'm back in plenary session video edition, joined by Kareen Tawaji, friend of the show. Uh, she's been on before to do Journal Club uh, with a fellow. Those days are numbered because she'll no longer be a fellow for much longer. Kareen, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be talking about the study today. Me too, me too. This is the clear trial. It is. Uh, so I guess we'll delve right into it. The okay, let's do it. So the CLEAR study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this past February. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if we look at the NCCN guidelines now, the uh, algorithms for first line treatment for metastatic renal cell cancer is becoming much more crowded. So we Very have- Very crowded, yeah. <laughs> all the new IO, TKI, uh, immunotherapy, TKI com combos that are now approved in the frontline setting. Mm -hmm. We also, in the poor intermediate group, have the dual immunotherapy with Evo, Nevo, Ipi, and then there's still a few single agent TKIs that remain approved in the first line setting. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of rationale for combining TKIs with IOs. We know that TKIs can help stimulate immunosuppressive regulatory T cells. And so today we're going to be discussing one of the IO TKI approvals with lumbatinib pembrolizumab, which was actually now approved as category one in both favorable risk renal cell cancer, as well as the poor intermediate risk renal cell cancer. I see. So, okay. So this is the study, the clear study. This is the lenvantinib pembro. People are, they're excited about all these drugs, but now lenvantinib pembro. So what are the combos? So we got Nevo Ipi, we got Pembro Axi, we got Avalumab Axi, we got Pembro Lenvantinib, and we got um, we got one more, Cabo, what's the Cabo one? Cabo Nevo. Yeah. Nevo Cabo. My goodness, so many things. I can't even I keep know. track. How do you pick? <laughs> I, wh whoever took me to dinner yesterday is whose drug I'm prescribing today. That's how I pick, but uh, well, you'll have to tell us how you pick. Okay, so clear study. Clear study is a is uh is the topic of the day new england journal paper i have i have to admit i haven't covered it on the podcast but full disclosure that's because we have a couple of papers that are about it that are under uh under under review right now and so i, I i'm scared to even say what we're pointing to because <laughs> who knows what who knows what these listeners will do with that information but you're going to take us through it you've done a journal club on this back uh, down there in new orleans i have yes so so, have so you are doing in the real world based on this approval. Oh, okay. And, um, and, and you have a sense of what the renal calcium are there, uh, what the attendings there are doing. Okay, great. Um, okay. So why don't you take us, take us through this paper? So, um, you know, who are, who are they looking at in this paper and what are they doing? So this is a phase three randomized trial and they actually had three arms. So they had lumbatinib pembrolizumab. They also had lumbatinib everolimus, mm -hmm. which was, which is approved in the second line setting. And they were trying to move it to the first line setting and they compared it against sunitinib. A three arm study, lenvantinib pembro, lenvantinib everlimus, and sunitinib. Everyone's favorite control arm. Yes. Everyone. Maybe maybe it'll be the control arm for another five more years. We'll just keep using it like chlorambucil and CLL. It'll still be the control arm. Okay. Well, that being said, I'll talk at the end about some other upcoming trials and oh, okay. there are other phase three trials that are actually using a different control arm. So you'll be okay. happy. Okay, good. I look forward to that. All right. So, um, so, so that's the layout, um, and uh, and uh, and who are they putting in this study? So they are putting patients with stage four RCC that have a, a pretty good performance status. So they had to have a Karnofsky of more than seventy. Mm -hmm. They had to have controlled blood pressure uh, mm -hmm. and adequate organ function as defined by certain lab parameters. And then the exclusion criteria are long, but just to summarize, um, untreated brain mets, radiation within three weeks, um, and then there are a few lab parameters in terms of uncontrolled, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hyperlipidemia, prolonged QTC, anything that could absorb uh, absorption of an oral drug, active autoimmune disease, and then anyone on long-term steroids, more than 7.5 milligrams prednisone per day. I see. Uh, among yeah. others. There's a long list, but uh, those are the general ones. Um, okay. And then patients were assigned to receive the 200 milligram dosing of pembrolizumab every three weeks with mm -hmm. lumbatinib 20. Oh boy. Or verilimus five milligrams with lumbatinib 18 milligrams per day or sinitinib uh, 50 four weeks on two weeks off. 
A hefty Thank dose you. of linvantinib to wash down the Pembro. Flat dose Pembro. Okay. Okay. So this is interesting. So I guess what you're painting the picture in my mind is, you know, although we're talking about um, um, good risk and intermediate risk patients in this study, um, they're also pretty fit. They're pretty fit. They have good organ function. They they dare not have high blood pressure. Um, and they have a Karnofsky, Karnofsky of 70. Um, in a number of ways, they look pretty good. They're looking pretty fit. Fair to say? Yes, definitely fair to say. Okay. And the endpoints that they looked at were, the primary endpoint was PFS, and then the secondary endpoints were OS and safety. Uh -huh. PFS. I guess to be fair, that's, that's, the, that's the way they like it in kidney cancer. They've always been in the PFS business. I think even the original, somebody will have to check, uh, listen, will have to check me, but I think in the 2007 sunitinib versus interferon study, the primary endpoint was also PFS. Uh, so it goes back, it goes back a ways. Um, and, um, and, and that's the primary endpoint here, but to be fair, they're also reporting OS, which is good for them to report. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of the statistical analysis, they estimated the sample size based on the estimates for the PFS analysis. So they approximated, uh, 1,050 patients for stratified randomization. And they calculated that the power of 90% with a two-sided alpha of 0.045 would be achieved um, for the lumbatinib, pembro, and sunitinib groups. Okay. It um, was slightly lower for the everolimus group. And what did they say they predicted the uh, PFS on the sunitinib to be? I thought it was like 11 or 12 months or something like that. 12.3 months. 12.3 months. Okay. Good to know. So that's their power calculation. So assuming a 12.3 month PFS of sunitinib, assuming a hazard ratio of what, 0.71-ish or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, Three arm study, interesting. You know, I guess they're they got two ways to two ways to put some lenvantinib, uh, two ways to get you to take lenvantinib. Okay, it's an interesting study design. Um, go on, yeah. And they enrolled patients at two hundred sites in twenty countries, and the median follow up for OS was twenty six point six months at the data cutoff of August twenty six, twenty twenty. Okay. So jumping into some of the results, we had, uh, in terms of clinical characteristics, they were pretty well distributed. So most patients were in the early 60s, uh, three quarters patients were male. There was inclusion of favorable intermediate and poor risk right. RCTs, um, as you but, mentioned. So, yeah. But, but very little poor risk. Very, yes, yes, so under 10% uh, poor risk in all three groups. Um, and in terms of PDL1 expression, about a third of patients uh, had a, a PDL1 combined positive score. Mm -hmm. um, and they, these were all clear cell, majority clear cell patients. So there was only anywhere from six to 8% of sarcomatoid patients that were included um, okay. in the study. Good. So, um, so jumping to the PFS results, they mm -hmm. did find that the PFS was longer in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group with the PFS of 23.9 months, as opposed to 9.2 months within the sunitinib group, mm -hmm. uh, with a hazard ratio for disease progression or death of 0 0.39 for the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group. Interesting. That's a low hazard ratio. I don't know what a hazard ratio is, but people tell me it's a uh a dimensionless ratio of the instantaneous hazard in one arm versus the other arm, whatever that shall mean. But I do know 0.39 is low. I know that's a low hazard ratio. And I, I see people say that's a low hazard yeah, ratio. So this actually, it, it is low. And, you know, we're not supposed to compare across trials, but I think, unfortunately, in this, um, in this scenario where you have so many drugs that are doing a similar, have a similar mechanism, right. there is more cross-trial comparison then there should be, um, and this is and the low be. hazard ratio that was seen in any of the combinations. I see. Okay, I've got questions, but yeah, okay, fair to note. Fair to note. I think, the, and then they also remind you of it in the discussion. They they won't let you forget. <laughs> their PFS is quite long. They say they won't let you forget that in their discussion. Okay, and, good. Thank and you, then medical writer. The lumbatinib everolimus group, the PFS was fourteen point seven months, and uh, as opposed to the nine point two months, with a hazard ratio of 0.65. So one thing that jumps out at me is that the uh, sunitinib arm has actually underperformed what they powered it for. You know, they wanted 12, um, but they got 9.3 months. Um, right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's notable. Makes me wonder what is going on. 
And actually, I'm going to check the original Bob Motzer paper in 2007 while you're, while you're taking us through the next thing. I'm curious what their PFS was in the 2007 paper. Ah, it was 11 months. In 2007, on Bob Motzer's paper, they got 11 months out of sunitinib. And in fact, they got five months out of interferon alpha. I remember correctly. I see a PFS here. I think PFS was the primary endpoint of that study. Um, that's interesting. All these years practicing giving sunitinib. And... Uh, Oh, we lost two months of PFS. That's, that's interesting to me. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Go on. Yeah. And the hazard ratio uh, was consistent across all the subgroups for PFS in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab arm. Um, jumping to overall survival, mm -hmm. the OS analysis, 79.2% of patients in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group were alive at 24 months as opposed to 66.1% in the lumbatinib everolimus group and 70.4% in the sunitinib group. They didn't reach median overall survival in any of the arms. And the hazard ratio for survival was 0.66 in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group, um, but it was not, for the everolimus arm, it was not statistically significant. Um, yeah, that's good to know. I think and if listeners have a chance to look at the curves, it'll look like, you know, if you look at the PFS curves, it looks like lenvantinib pembro in first place, lenvantinib everolimus in second place, sunitinib in third place. But when you look at the OS curves, lenvantinib pembro in first place, sunitinib probably in second place, and then lenvantinib everolimus in third place. Although the, on, the statistical significance, of course, only lenvantinib pembro versus sunitinib. They don't have, they didn't design it to compare the other arms. Right. And then in terms of the response rates, there were 71% of patients in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group that had a confirmed objective response, as opposed to 53.5% in the lumbatinib everolimus group and 36% in the sunitinib group. They had a complete response of 16% in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group, as opposed to 9.8% in the everolimus arm and 42 in the sunitinib group. And the median duration of response in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group was 25.8 months. Mm, okay, interesting. Um, okay, it's all sounding good for lenvantinib pembro. It is sounding pretty good. It is sounding um, good. And so in terms of subsequent uh, lines of therapy, and I, I was watching a lecture earlier this week and they assessed, you know, the percentage of patients with stage four RCC that go on to second line treatment and a study showed that about 50% of patients go on to second line treatment. Interesting. Who said and, this? Uh, this say? was, um, it was on, on the, I think it's the George Washington. Okay. Uh, uh huh. Uh, okay. Okay. Go on, go on. So, so that's what, the, that's what they're benchmark benchmarking it. Go on. So, so here about in terms of it was similar in the lumbatinib pembrolizumab group, 55% of patients went on to second line therapy after, um, of which half had anti-angiogenic therapy, 13% had a PD-1 or PDL one inhibitor, and then 3% mTOR inhibitor, 3% CTLA-4 inhibitor. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So should I do my rant now? Or you want to, I'll save it for the end. I'll save my rant for the end. Okay, okay, go on, go on, yeah. Just in terms of safety quickly, yeah. you know, most patients had adverse events, diarrhea, hypertension, and asymptomatic. Yes. Uh, I believe it was amylase elevation were the most common side effects. There wasn't anything really unexpected in terms of safety events. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, you know, in the discussion part of this journal, um, they do highlight the notable median progression for survival in lumbatinib pembrolizumab group, 23.9 months, and the percent of patients that had an objective response, which was 71%. Mm -hmm. um, we do, we can jump into some of the limitations with this study, and I know you have probably a lot of things to say. Well, I only have a couple of things that I'm going to say, but uh, because a, lot, a couple of things I have are secret. Okay. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'm, I'm willing to say. Okay. okay. Uh, so, you know, some things that we wish that they had done more of in this study is included a higher number of poor risk patients, mm -hmm. included more non-clear cell or sarcomatoid patients. Right. Um, they didn't have any patient reported outcomes or quality of life metrics in this right. particular study. 
Um, and it was an open label design. There is no race breakdown available. And, you know, historically, that's a good point. African American patients may have worse outcomes and the incident seems to be rising for RCC and there was no race breakdown whatsoever, um, even in the supplemental. Um, we know that the patients had a good performance status. So in the real world, some of these patients may have less than a KPS of 70. And I think, you know, the number one thing with this study is that it was compared to Sinitinib, which is no longer a category one standard of care. And unfortunately, all of these studies that are now approved with these IOTKI regimens are comparing these regimens to sinitinib. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the major issue that people are going to have with this study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're, you're a, a budding GU oncologist is, are you not? Yeah. Okay. So, so how, I don't know, I guess I'm curious what your practice is and I'm curious where, where, you know, where this is, is this changing your practice? What, what do you, what were you doing maybe a few months ago? What are you doing now? Who are you thinking about for this? Are you, do you like Axi Pembro? I don't, I, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I have used Axi Pembro. I think at the end of the day, if you look at Axi Pembro, yes, Lumba Pembro or Cabo Nevo, yes. they're all pretty similar. So oh, I I, that's what I say. Okay. They're all pretty similar. Fair yeah, enough. So I, I don't think that anyone would really have a strong argument to say for sure that one is better than the other. There's minor subtle differences, you know, Cabo Nevo had quality of life metrics. Some of, you know, this study had um, the lowest hazard ratio in terms of PFS. Um, you know, we can't compare, but in terms of picking one of these, I think whatever your practice decides on, it should be one regimen is picked. The ent entire practice understands how to dose it, how to dose adjust. Mm -hmm. and look for the side effects specific to that regimen. That's a good point. Yeah. Actually, it's a good opportunity for any of the people listening who work for um, uh, insurers or something that you can negotiate a deal with one of these. Uh, you know, I think they're all interchangeable, as you point out. And so whatever you can, you can build into standard practice and get the best deal on, maybe that's the, that's the doublet you go with. Right. And I think in terms of Nevo Ipi, that might still be the... Uh, treatment of choice if you have someone that's not extremely symptomatic from the get-go that has the possibility of the long-term response. Right. Especially for a younger patient with a low symptomatic burden. I think right. most people would pick the dual immunotherapy regimen. Mm -hmm. I think one argument that I heard for picking Nevo Cabo in the first line is that you still have lumbatinib everolimus in the second line available. Okay if you wanted okay. to make that argument, uh, whereas the other regimens, you know, you might end up with a single agent TKI in the second line setting. Okay, um, that's interesting. So you get, and, two do you get two doublets that way. That is true. You get a double doublet. Right. And same and, with Axi Pembro. You can do Axi Pembro then Lenvantan ever Everlimus. Right, that's true. Yeah. Um, and I think, honestly, I think this is gonna continue to change. So. I think people are very excited about the HIF alpha inhibitors. And I'll mention some phase three trials that are underway. There's the HIF alpha in inhibitor um, called Bizaltifan, which is being studied in a phase three study with lumbatinib Pembro. Compare, there's also a three arm compared to Pembro lumbatinib with a CTLA-4, which is called Quavum. Well, you, you cut out a second. What's um, the name of that CTLA-4? Maybe, maybe the, the internet wanted to conspire against you because you cut out for a second. That CTLA-4, what was the name of that thing? It sounded crazy. Quivonlamab. I don't even know. Quivonlamab. Oh my God. Quivonlamab. You know, it's really amazing how many new words we have to learn in this line of work. You know, surgeons, they haven't learned new words in a long time. They have the same words. We always learn a new words. So, you know, I, okay. Qu qu what is it? Quiv quiver? It's like quivon. Yeah, Q U A V O N Lima. Q U A. Oh my God. They really want you to use the brand name there. Okay. Uh, right. Q U A. Whew. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's exciting that there's a new control arm. You know, Lumbatin and Pembro is a control arm in this. In this oh, is it really? Yeah. Interesting. And what's the intervention arm? It's a CTLA4, a PDL1, and something? And Lumbatinib or oh, a HIF alpha inhibitor with Pembro and Lumbatinib. 
Oh, so, wow. You know, okay. you also worry about the toxicity that could occur. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's coming. Um, there's also another study looking at this HIF alpha inhibitor with lumbatinib, um, but that's compared to cabozantinib, single agent. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think another big study that will be completing in 2022 is the pedigree study. So that is nevo ipi followed by maintenance nevo or maintenance nevo cabo mm -hmm. depending on the response um, after four cycles of the dual immunotherapy interesting interesting so there's a lot on the horizon this is exploding rcc is the the heyday of rcc it really is so you know, for a long time we had we had interferon which wasn't that good and then we had sunitinib uh, and then we had sunitinib versus pazopinib in that GSK-sponsored study that made pazopinib look really good. Turns out they happen to be the makers of pazopinib. And so a lot of people switched, but they didn't pull over everybody. There were still a few of us holdouts who didn't like an upper bound non-inferiority margin, didn't like an, who did not like an upper bound non-inferiority margin of 1.22, I think. Um, the, I think the margin was 1.25 and the actual result was 1.22. Um, and, and now finally, Avelumab, Axi, Pembro, Axi, Lenvantanib, Pembro, Nevo, Ipi, and Cabo, Cabo, Nevo. We have so many options. Okay. I guess um, I'll give you my two cents on what I think somebody should do here. Okay. I'm going to look right into the camera and say this. Hey, listen, somebody out there, you're a GU oncologist. You work for a cooperative group. Here's the study you do. In the control arm of this study, you let you let cooperative group doctors pick any of these doublets that are on the market. You let them pick Pembroaxi if they like it. Let them give Avelumab, uh, Axi, whatever you want. In the intervention arm of your treatment, we have to ask ourselves, why is it Pembroaxitinib and not Pembrosunitinib versus Sunitinib? Why is it? Nobody, everyone wants to get Sunitinib out of that front line, right? And I think it's because the shot clock is running out on that patent and Sunitinib is going to be cheap. So here's what you do in your cooperative group. You do your control arm is any of these doublets. Any of these things, they're all acceptable standards of care, I think as Corrine has nicely shown, and I, and I don't dispute that. Your intervention arm is simple. It is, you give Pembro, Sunitinib. You give three doses of Pembro, and then it discontinues the Pembro, and you discontinue the Sunitinib. So there's gonna be your PD-1 responders. Let's see how many responders you'll pick up in the first, you know, first three months of therapy, you can Pembro. You discontinue that. You save the Pembro so they can get it again later. Why are all these arms? They all continue the PD-1 indefinitely. Of course, all the companies are wanting to get to, they wanted you to use their drugs, you know? So in your cooperative group study, you test any of these doublets versus Pembro, three doses, Sunitinib, and you and you look for overall survival. And then you ask, then let you know investigators do whatever they want, post-protocol, et cetera. And you ask, can you get away with three upfront doses of pd one try to pick off those people who are really, um, you know, uh, immune evasion is playing a role in their tumor. And then you continue the student if there. Um, I think you're gonna have a much cheaper regimen, better tolerated, less um, less treatment, less infusions. Uh, I think you're gonna, I think you'll actually beat them. I think you'll, I mean, I think you'll at least tie an OS. I actually think you might win an OS for a couple of reasons that I don't wanna get into just yet, but I will someday. Um, so that's my, that's my guess. Oh, I like that tape. I mean, hopefully someone will listen to this. Then. Oh, I know who. Perhaps somebody in the Canadian Clinical Trials Group, or soon to be, may, may listen in. Because they do, they do these kinds of studies, good studies. Sure. Noted. <laughs> okay. So what about, what, what's the talk around the water cooler? What do your colleagues say about this? I don't think it changes much, you know, in terms of the way that the RCC treatment landscape is moving along. I don't okay. Think groundbreaking with the previous approvals with those other IOTKIs. I think it doesn't really answer a new clinical question or, or offer a significantly better treatment for patients mm. um, as compared to the other ones that were already approved. Yeah, and I guess I see these people talking a big game about that 20 some month PFS. And I think what they mean by that is that's a better PFS than the other one, so you should use our drug. But the truth is, as you pointed out, there are a number of ways in which they've kind of pick and choose the patients in the study. And I'm not sure that all the other trials, I don't know off the top of my head, but I don't know if all the other trials use the same kind of inclusion rules. And so those kind of comparisons are already fraught. They're probably especially fraught now. Right. I have one more right. thing to so, say. Oh, no, go on. No, I, th I think... Um, like you said, some of the other studies might have had a higher number of sarcomatoid patients. Right. Um, they all had fairly similar numbers of poor, intermediate, and favorable risk. Obviously, Nevo IP didn't have any favorable risk patients. But what about these hypertension rules? Do the other ones have these hypertension rules on the enrollment? 
That's I think good. most TKI trials have these hypertension rules. <laughs> As far as I'm aware. Of course they do. Of course they do. Uh, well, we all can go back to the great AXIS study where there was, you know, an AXIS, exitinib versus serafinib in the second line setting in RCC. Um, they were, of course, these drugs, one of the side effects is hypertension. So that's one of the reasons you want to maybe exclude people with baseline hypertension. But in the AXIS trial, I think if you had hypertension while on drug, you were allowed to get more blood pressure medicine with exitinib than the control arm serafinib. And there were like different rules for dose escalation and dose reduction. We wrote about that in the JCO in a paper called Oral Anti-Cancer Drugs and dosing. Um, but the point I wanted to make here was um, that the post-protocol therapy, everyone loves to cite the real world. And they say in the real world, only 50% of people, you know, they get post-protocol therapy. So we had 50% get post-protocol therapy. That's totally fine. But of course, this isn't a real world study. You're not taking everybody coming in off in your clinic. You're taking people who have Karnowski 70, who have, you know, uh, they meet all these parameters. Um, they're, 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 probably overwhelmingly Caucasian. They don't even want to report it. I mean, they don't even tell us, but who knows? Um, so, so I guess what I want to say is that statistic, the percent of people who get to second line, you need that statistic from uh, US-based patients who look like these patients in the study. And right. I think that's not going to be 50%. I think it's going to be, and you can figure it out from the PFS and OS curves, but it should be something in the ballpark of 70, maybe 65, 70, 80, 85%. I think it should be in that ballpark. And the reason they're not getting post-protocol therapy is that this is running in, I think, as you said, 200 nations, and some of which they don't afford second-line PD-1 therapy. And right. I guess, to be honest, if you progress on sunitinib, I'm surprised that you know they're very proud to say the most common second-line therapy is IO, but it should be even more common than it is. It should be even more common because that's what we do. We give them, we, you would, you give them a crack at an immunotherapy drug, and we have that randomized trial of, I believe, Nevo in the second line showing a survival benefit um, mm -hmm. in RCC. And so I think the post-protocol therapy is not up to par. I don't like it. I think they, a lot of people here are rationalizing using data that is not comparable to make the claim that we couldn't have gotten any higher when I think you could have gotten it a lot higher if you had mandated. And in fact, if proof is they could have just mandated in the protocol, um, like the protocol could have specified and provided pembrolizumab or nivolumab second line. Um, and then the other thought is, you know, lenvantinib, everlimus, I think uh, it beat everlimus, which is also not the strongest, not the strongest second line drug. Um, I, I, I personally don't like cabo. I think it's a, I think it's a very intolerable drug. I think the lenvantinib dose here, we'll see what the real world dose reductions are, but I don't think a lot of people can really take 20. It's a heck of a dose. Right. Uh, so I think that'll, that'll fall. Um, that's why I think the cooperative group, like somebody, you can dethrone all of these players. You can do a control arm, any of these doublets you pick and you give them sunitinib, but you really commit to that dose of sunitinib and give them a few doses of Pembro and then take it away, save the money and save the Pembro and then reintroduce it on, on relapse if you need to. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can, that's your, cause this is an experimental arm. I'm, I'm hypothesizing. I think you'll even beat these people. You'll, I mean, you'll beat any of these arms and you'll mm -hmm. save, you'll save the patient a lot of infusions. You'll save your payer a lot of money. Um, this is a, a place that's ripe for a good cooperative group study. So someone, someone heed this offer. Mm -hmm. I do it, but I don't do a lot of GU in my practice, not anymore. Once upon a time, I was interested. Now I've been, my, I've been pushed, to, pushed asunder, pushed asunder here, there. So any last thoughts on this? You know, I think you bring up the point that the way that some of these trials are designed just needs to be changed a little bit so it's, more affordable, more convenient, and has better outcomes for the patients that are ultimately going to be getting this. You know. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Are you prepared to talk about your next step in the future? I am. Okay. I will it's be, official? It is official. I'm doing another fellowship. <laughs> okay, yes. Five seven in geo-oncology with a focus on immuno-oncology clinical trials. So so perhaps you might be this person to do such a wonderful study. And where are you going to do this? I will be going to Ottawa, uh, where I'm from, back in Canada. So back home good. to Canada. Very so, uh, so you have basically signed up for a 100 degree Fahrenheit temperature change. Is that fair to say? Yes, definitely. Very <laughs> hot in New Orleans right now. Yeah, but it seems, is it the same time zone? No, Eastern time zone. You go one time zone over. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think... Um, Listeners will know that uh, I have previously railed about extra fellowships. However, I put a, I placed an asterisk at a subsequent at a subsequent date. I placed an asterisk 
for the Canadians. Because in Canada, I think they are more prone to doing it because of vagaries of how the faculty positions open. And I think it will be a good opportunity and you will likely learn a great deal. And I also think Canada is a great place to practice as an academician. We've had so many lovely folks from Canada on this podcast over the years. I mean, many, many, many friends of the show uh, have been on this podcast. Um, and I think the reason in part that this podcast is probably so popular in Canada and is so and has so many Canadian guests is that, um, you know, there's so many different things you can listen to in oncology. And many uh, mantra in oncology is more drugs earlier, often continuous, which ironically, all these, all these uh, you know, doublets that you've talked about, they all offer that advantage. Um, but that's an advantage for the company to sell their product. Um, and, and that advantage is very real in the United States, a very for-profit system, fragmented system, um, a very sort of unequal system, depending on what insurance you have and who's your doctor. Um, and it's actually shocking that, you know, as you point out, depending on you, you could get Bob on Monday and Axie Pembro, and you can get on Tuesday, um, you know, you'll get uh, Cabo Nevo, depending on the doctor. And and your point about standardization is good because probably the whole practice might not only get a better deal, but may even be able to deliver better outcomes if they all commit to a certain protocol. Um, what, what the, the beauty of standardization in medicine. Anyway, I guess the point here is that in Canada, of course, um, the bulk of the academic jobs are, are, uh, are, I think all of the academic jobs are much less conflicted than the US, much more hard money, much less soft money, much less... Uh, uh, less of a need to, I mean, and to my understanding, not at all, like you don't need to run trials to support your salary and things like that. And so the conditions are naturally ripe for people to be, I think, arguably more impartial about whether or not drugs are right for the patients. Um, the way the healthcare system works, doctors are incentivized to be more of a steward, to think about what's best for all of us, not just um, what's the most expensive thing you can give that might be best, but obviously it's, there's uncertainty because the trials never really ask the right questions, as you point out. Um, so I think it's a great place to practice and doing the extra year will be terrific. And it'll probably be great to be back, back up north. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm still looking at jobs in the US for the following year, but oh, we'll for permanent. So you don't want to burn that bridge. I'll keep you posted uh, on my job horizon after this year. Okay, well, I will say this, but keep an eye out for political elections because if political elections go, go one way or the other, you might just want to stay up there and I'll be joining you over. <laughs> Depending on what happens in this country, we might all be headed up north soon. So Kareen Tawaji, it's a pleasure to have you I talk about the CLEAR study, a very interesting study. Um, I think we covered 75% uh, of the things that I see I see only 25% of the things that someday I will mention on this podcast on a future date, once that paper is accepted, firmly accepted in the hands of a publisher. But thank you so much. I think you, you took us through it nicely. And I think I agree with your assessment about the landscape of all these products. So thanks for doing it. Yeah, thank you for having me.